on video because they're late, stuck in the horrible traffic that I was just stuck in. But um, so most people here are from the Harvard Heidelberg Star Formation meeting. We may have a few people who are coming early to, to listen to one, two, but they will be late because of the traffic. Okay. <laughs> so um, for the record, for those of you who don't know Juan Soler, um, he is a famous product of the country of Colombia. He is a <laughs> famous science writer. He is a hero in the country of Colombia. And I think he is a hero in astronomy as well because he started out working, he, he got his PhD in Toronto after his undergraduate work and master's in Colombia. And um, he started out working on uh, the cosmic microwave background and, and balloon experiments and all kinds of stuff. And in there somewhere, he became very expert about polarization, um, which we know is very important and not enough people appreciate, <laughs> um, and magnetic fields and turbulence and the interstellar medium and phases of the interstellar medium. And he's lived in many countries in Europe. And he currently has an appointment uh, in Rome uh, where he's working on topics that involve feedback and how it shapes the interstellar medium. But as you've probably seen the last few days, he knows a lot about a lot of things. So um, you should just store up all the good questions for the end. And I can't wait to see what you have to say, Juan. Oh, and you should also read his books, especially if you read Spanish, because they're in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> that helps. Thank you again, Juan. Oh. oh, you don't need that. Yeah. Thanks very much, Elisa. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, thanks, Hendrik, and all of the organizers of this meeting. For me, uh, Harvard Heidelberg is a little bit like a, like homecoming. Uh, I can trace many of my career highlights to Harvard Heidelberg. And thank you to you, uh, Blakesley. You actually were the first person that invited me when I was in Paris, not in Harvard, not in Heidelberg, to come to the first meeting. So thank you. So let's not stand in ceremony and let's talk about feedback and the ISM. So uh, this is kind of a mouthful of a topic, how feedback shapes the interstellar medium. There's lots of disentangled there. So just a disclaimer, this is going to be my biased view from looking at the distribution of the dust and the gas in the nearby clouds and in the Milky Way. So not so much talk about all, all the galaxies. And it's going to be a very broad ride. So I'm going to flash my collaborators here. This, I'm going to be presenting some work that is uh, developing in the company of these lovely people. Some of them may be sitting among you. So let's just start. So what, what is a stellar feedback? So stellar feedback is the generic way in which we call the energy and momentum input from stars. And that begins already when the stars are being formed. So we have protostellar jets, which are bipolar outflows of mass and energy that are produced across the mass spectrum. So you have them in low mass stars, in high mass stars, and they deliver energy already when the stars are just born. Later, when they enter the main sequence, we have winds. So winds are just uh, supersonic outflows coming from the stars as well. And this, if you're thinking of winds like the wind of the sun, so that's a coronal wind. So it's a relatively weak wind. When we have massive stars, we have winds that are produced by the interaction between the UV photons and the ions and the atoms around them. So these are orders of magnitude more mass loss than the mass loss that we have in the sun. In the sun, we have 10 to the minus 8. These stars 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5 solar masses per year. And you can have very powerful winds when you have a wolf radius star. You can be losing as much as 0.1 solar masses every year. So it's a lot of energy delivery and mass delivery into the ISM. Stars, of course, produce light. That's why we see them. And uh, that light has uh, momentum. So uh, and it has the ability to ionize the surroundings. So there's also radiation involved in the picture of feedback. And of course, at the end of their lives, the stars explode into supernova. So that's what I generally talk about this. So why do we, why do we even care about this? This is very cool. It seems kind of episodic, but it's instrumental for how the universe looks right now. So let's go back on why do we care about this. So this beautiful picture comes from 1974. And this is one of the first observations of UV absorption towards stars. So each one of these, uh, uh, of these bluffs in the plot is showing a star, a bright star in the UV. And uh, the extension in this dimension is the column density that is tracing. And in this dimension is the distance to that star. So most distant stars are just um, bluffs elongated in this direction. And you see that the column density is traced are around 10 to the 14 uh, particles per square centimeter. So this line, this OV absorption in the UV, is indicated, indicating that the, the, the galaxy is filled with hot gas, gas that is around 10 to the 5 uh, 
uh, Kelvin and it's all around us, or at least all around us as we see them with these stars. Three years later, using sounding rockets, so rockets that don't go into orbit, so just go up, you make your observation, then it comes down, uh, they observe the soft X-ray background. And they notice that there is a soft X-ray background that is pervading the whole galactic plane. So they observe it in three bands. This is the intermediate band. Uh, this would be uh, related to the North Galactic Spur that apparently we see in X-rays as well. But this is all around. So this is telling us there's hot gas all around. It's uh, very pervasive. It's very diffuse, but it's everywhere. So with that, we come to the model that we have currently of the phases of the ISM. So this is a seminal work by Stryker and McKee in which they imagine a very, uh, a, a very idealized blob of material. So you have cold H1 in the middle, warm neutral medium outside, hot uh, neutral medium around it, and then a uh, uh, warm ionized medium outside, and this is all in a bath of very hot gas. So you can see it like this. And then this hot gas would be produced by multiple supernova explosions that are diffusing this gas all around the ISM. So this works, and uh, it highlights how important is the, the feedback of the supernova that we were just thinking as isolated objects. They're actually setting the multi-phase structure of the ISM. Another reason is this one. So this is work from Marc-Antoine Miville de Chen. Here we're looking at an object at high galactic latitude. We don't really know where that is, what this is. Even in the 3D dust mass, this is too small. Uh, but most likely, it's not very far. It's very high galactic latitude, and we see it in dust. So here you see the uh, Planck dust radiance, so the integrated Planck SED. Here you see it in, y, uh, in WISE at 12 microns, so pHs. And then here, Megacam, and uh, this is mostly scatter light from the dust. So this is the same object seen at very high resolution from the very large scales into the very small scales. And when you do a power spectrum, you see a power low power spectrum in density that extends over three decades. This is not an object that is mainly dominated by gravity. This is something that is out there and is self-similar over three orders of magnitude. This has to be the work of turbulence. How does that turbulence enter into the ISM? How is it maintained? Well, feedback is not the only answer, but it's probably one of the good candidates for that. There's another reason why feedback can be interesting, and is it can trigger the formation of new generations of stars. So this is an idea that comes from Blau in 1964, when he observed that the most massive stars, they come in families of ages. They are not formed just in one chunk, but they are in age uh, bins separated by a couple of mega years. So this is maybe suggesting that the stars are not forming all at once, but they're forming in processes that are triggered by the previous generation of stars. So this is a beautiful cartoon from a paper by Bruce L. McGrim and Charlie Lada, in which they show how this group, uh, the energy and momentum can be accumulating some of the gas that is then producing a younger generation of stars at the edge of this cloud. So simply by gathering another parcel of gas and making it dense, you're triggering a star formation, although that word may not be liked by everyone. What is true is that it also, stellar feedback, also disrupts molecular clouds. So this is an example. This is from the work of Doris Arsumanian in the Herschel molecular cloud. What we're seeing here is the cocoon nebula. So this is uh, a little bit below the galactic plane. We see here the whole cloud in uh, cold dust, so in the longest wavelengths with Herschel. And then we see the cocoon nebula that is most likely produced by a B star in its interior. So uh, it's also disrupting the cloud from which it's born. So how do we put all of these things together? Well, in the end, these are all different phases or different processes that are connecting the large scale cycle of matter and energy in the ISM. You pass from the molecular clouds, you form your stars, you have the, uh, the protostellar outflows, winds and jets that deliver some of the hot gas into the ISM, supernova explosion that enrich the interstellar medium, and then that can uh, have effects on large galactic scales, as I'm going to show later. The gas cools down, and then the whole process begins again. This is a very beautiful picture, but to this day, we are not able to put numbers in each one of the processes. We don't know how much energy goes and uh, enters and where it goes and where it does it. So it's like an accounting process. Like we're following the money. We're following the energy and, uh, and the mass. But it's just very complicated. As you see, we have scales that extend orders of magnitude in density and in physical scales. So it's a very complicated topic. But I mean, that's our bread and butter, no? So uh, of course, broad dynamic range. 
There are multiple mechanisms. Basically, all of the modern physics is encompassed in stellar feedback, from quantum mechanics to uh, observations in multiple uh, wavelengths. All of the expertise in multiple aspects of physics is required to understand feedback. So just a brief idea, and is stellar feedback and the ISM is too much for only one astronomer. So the only way that we can solve all of this mess is by taking the different points of view and putting them together. So that's what I'm going to try and do today. And let's begin here. So anybody recognizes this constellation? Orion, exactly. So Orion is very easy, has some blue stars. But if you see Orion like I saw it for many years, Orion looks like this. So this is from uh, the Planck emission at 850 gigahertz. So this is mostly dust emission. And then uh, there are two clouds that are attached to Orion. This is called Orion A and Orion B. Not very creative names, but that's how we know them. Inside of Orion, if you see it a little bit deeper, this is now the view of Herschel. And Orion, of course, has many things inside of it. So here you're seeing with the ripples, you're seeing the direction of the magnetic field traced by the polarization sampled by Planck at 353 gigahertz. And then you see dust in different temperatures. So you see red uh, dust at longer wavelengths, so most likely cooler dust, like around 10 Kelvin. And then you see hotter dust around here, where we know there is some star formation going on. If you look at that, not in dust, but you see it in uh, carbon monoxide emission, you can get a sense of the kinematics of this region. And what people find in the kinematic of this region is not only the motion of the cloud, but there are certain parts in which you have these outflows. So they see bipolar outflows throughout the cloud, not only in the high mass star formation part of Orion, but throughout the cloud they see these bipolar uh, outflows. So you can make a census of the outflows, and this is what we know about outflows. This comes from the, uh, from the review by John Bally, and uh, most of the theory from the review by uh, Ralph Podrich and, and Ray. And of course this is exaggerated, actually the disk is much smaller than this, but uh, but you get the scale here. So the disk, which is 100 AU, more or less, this is a standard size of a disk for Orion, is ejecting through magnetic winding, energy and momentum that produce a chalked cavity, and then we see the CO and some other species that are accumulated in the site. And this process is important because when you eject angular momentum and matter, in the end you are limiting the mass of these stars. This is a process that is uh, related to what is going to be the, my, the final mass of the stars. And that is important for the evolution of the stars further on, the planets that surround them, and also the energy input into the interstellar medium. Actually, Estella Ofner and, uh, and Liu, they observed that maybe the protostellar outflows can be a source of the turbulence that we see in some of the molecular clouds. So let's get back to this picture. What else do we see in Orion? In Orion, if you see it in uh, visible light, is very bright around here. And what we're seeing there is one of the most famous objects in astronomy. M42 is visible even uh, at the naked eye. And what we're seeing there is the best example of a nearby H2 region, a nearby region that is influenced by the energy and momentum input from, hot, uh, from a mass, high mass star. So the stars more likely are here. It still has some hot gas, and that hot gas um, is surrounded by a layer of um, dust that is also warmed up by the light from that star. And when you see it in H alpha, which is the Lyman alpha line, you're seeing that uh, there is ionization. There's active ionization produced by that star. Most likely what we're seeing, and then this is a zoom in, uh, this is in multiple frequencies in uh, visible and microwave, is the following. So uh, we see, of course, that. And we also see the small disks around here, these objects called uh, proplets, which are most likely uh, protoplanetary disks that are exposed to a very intense uh, environment in energy and momentum. So there's a chalk layer produced by the stellar wind interacting with the protoplanetary disk. So that's what we're seeing. And that is interesting because if you think of the environments in which this can live, this is a very extreme environment. And this is just fresh out of the oven. This is a paper by fellow Colombian and MPI astronomer uh, Maria Claudia Ramirez Tanus, and she's showing that even in a very intense environment, this is another uh, H2 region, this is a little bit further, and you see 6357, uh, the disk still has some of the same species that we see in the disks in more quiet environments, in nearby disks. So at least for one example, 
this very string environment is not changing what we're seeing in the protoplanetary disks, which is interesting. This is just one example, but they have more. So we just have to wait and see. But definitely, this is an ext extreme environment to form your planets and your stars. What else do we see in that image? So we see that cocoon. So most likely what happened here a uh, couple of mil uh, uh, million years ago is the stars that are in the trapezium starting putting uh, energy in the form of winds. Those winds were confined while the surroundings of the stars were really dense. So those confined winds expanded really fast and created a cavity full of hot gas. After that cavity was created, the hot gas inside of there was cooled down or escaped through the cavities. And then what you have is the ramp pressure from the winds reaching the edge of the shell or the light of the stars reaching the edge of that shell. So here you're not dominated by the energy that is uh, um, uh, stuck there in that cavity, but by the momentum that is delivered by the ramp pressure and by the incoming photons. And then after a while, you're just left with a free expanding cavity. And several things can happen then. This has been modeled in a very nice way by Daniel Rana and Eric Pellegrini and the team of uh, Ralph Klesen. And it's, so this would be that first phase that I mentioned, dominated by the winds, by the momentum then, and then the free expansion. But the free expansion can only go on as far as it can beat gravity. If you have enough mass, doesn't matter how much feedback you have, you're going to recollapse. And that's what they try to encompass with, with, with this one dimensional model. And there's at least one example uh, so this is an example of what that model would point out. So if you have uh, a massive cloud, 10 to the 5 solar masses cloud, then you would be initially dominated by the winds pretty fast. You pass into the momentum dominated phase. So you have the direct radiation, the winds and the gravity. And as the winds start beating gravity, then you kind of have the mass of the, of the cloud already determined by, um, by the feedback input. But if the cloud is very massive, then you have the hot winds, then you enter into the wind phase and the radiation phase, but then gravity overcomes any kind of momentum and energy input that you can put through feedback, and then you have another recollapse. And we have at least one example of that. This is the work of Michael Hugel. So here is three parsecs just for reference. Uh, this is w, uh, um, W49A. So this is a star forming region that has a very interesting characteristic and is that has several clusters with different ages. So most likely this cloud has undergone, it has enough mass to have undergone several phases of collapse and recollapse where the feedback opposes gravity, then feedback wins, then you have a recollapse and then you have a new generation of stars. And apparently this is something that can happen if your cloud is very massive. What else do we see towards uh, M42? So uh, this is now an insert into what JWST is showing us. So this is the inner part of JWST. Here, you're dominated, of course, by all of these processes that I've been mentioning. But you also see here the protoplanetary disks. Some of them uh, around there, you can also see even the jets. So this is the environment in which all of these stars and planets around those stars are going to form. So there's one of the most important objects, the Orion bar. Ah, no, not this one. <laughs> the Orion bar, so this is the prototypical region of photodissociation. So see, this is the work of, uh, the work of Javier Goicoechea. So he's showing the layer surface at the edge of, the, uh, of, this, uh, of this bar. So not that bar, this bar. This is the Orion bar. So in that bar, he's seeing ionized material. So see, he sees the ionization front. He sees the heating of the pHs. And then he sees the warm molecular gas that is directly behind that. So this is the textbook example that we try to apply to every single other age to region. This is the prototype for that. But as you can see, there's only one Orion bar. The rest of the region is kind of uh, more complicated. And uh, we have data that shows that. So these are observations in C+, so it's showing ionization of carbon. And this is the work of Cornelia Pabst, and uh, it's using observations from Sophia. So what we can see here, is not only the distribution of those shells, we see the ionized layer of those shells. So uh, this is exposed to the ionization from the radiation from these stars, most likely. These are O and B stars in the middle of these regions. But we can also see the expansion in this tracer. So we see an expansion of a few kilometers per second in this region. We already saw that it has hot gas inside. This is a relatively young region that is still in the expansion phase. 
what else do we learn from that? That it's not only the initial chalk that is flowing material out, but that there's a back chalk that is producing this scalloping for rally, uh, rally jeans, uh, rally tailor uh, instability. So we see this scalloping and that can be explained by the difference in temperature between the layer that has been flowed out and the back chalk. So uh, this is also explained. And something that we haven't seen before is this. There is a counterpart of this shell also in atomic hydrogen. So uh, it's not only molecular material that has been blown out, there's also an atomic layer that we hadn't seen before. So this is work from my own uh, VLA uh, DRA program of observation, where what I'm aiming at is improving the observations of H1 towards nearby molecular clouds. This is the uh, H1 that we had before, so completely dominated by the continuum source there, but now we can actually resolve the bubble, and as you saw in the previous image, we can see the two sources, M43 and M42. So this is great because now we actually know the mass that is in that layer. If you only take the C plus as a tracer of mass, you're exposed to all kinds of radiative effects. And it turns out that if you calculate the mass with the H1, there's a factor of 100 more mass than we expected for that, uh, for that shell. So the energy input and the momentum input that has flow away this bubble has to be larger. So we have been wrong in the accounting if we only depend on one tracer. So that is to emphasize the, uh, the multi-phase importance of this. Uh, again, we're trying to do this with more clouds. So uh, this is H1 over the whole uh, galactic plane for nearby channels between minus 20 and 20. And what we're doing is just filling the gap in the observations of H1. So we have H1 observations for uh, Four of, uh, five of those regions at arc minute resolution, where the previous resolution is, at best, 16 arc minutes. So we're going a factor of 16 resolution to resolve those places around star formation regions, like here in Orion A, that I already mentioned, Orion B, and Monosaurus R2, and some other more nearby regions. So if you're interested in this, uh, and you like to play with interferometric data, uh, please let me know. So let's go back to Orion A. Uh, what else are we learning there from Orion A? Well, when you see Orion A really, really far, all you can see is the light that is coming from it, so the SED. And that is what is happening for most of the regions in the Milky Way. So this is from the uh, Heigl survey led by Sergio Molinari. And here you're seeing the galactic plane in three different colors. There we cannot dissect the H2 regions or the dust distribution of temperatures across the cloud, but we can learn about the distribution across wavelengths. So you can observe a source across many wavelengths, and you can do uh, games like you can classify them as if they are pre-stellar, so before forming a star, so most likely they are cold, so they won't have emission at the lower wavelengths, or protostellar when they have emission at 70 microns, so that's the lowest wavelength of uh, Herschel. And then you can even take this game a little bit further, and it's the following. The energy, the emission from those clumps, as we call them, they're just compact sources in this, uh, in this millimeter map, that dust has to be heated by the stars inside of it. So you can use the emission and the shape of the SED to infer a star formation rate from those clumps. So that is what Sergio and David Elia did. They have a semi-empirical relation, and I call it semi-empirical because it's calibrated for nearby clouds. In nearby clouds, you can go and you count your YSOs. So those are new stars. You divide by the mass, and then you have a time that it takes from the protostellar object to become a star. So that gives you a rate. So you can, uh, you can calibrate that relation, and then you apply that to all of the clumps that you identify in this galactic plane survey. And that is what David Elia did. And that leads us to uh, this, that is the profile of a star formation in the Milky Way. So the black line that you see here is the distribution of a star formation with respect to the galactic center. So we have a bump around five kilometers from the galactic center, and then a decrease of almost two orders of magnitude from galactocentric radius of five to galactocentric radius of around 12. Okay? And then for the inner galaxy, it seems to go down, and here it is very hard because we cannot really trust our kinematic distances. So that is very cool. First, it looks better than the other curve. So the previous work uh, was Eve Ligia and Norm Murray uh, at CETA. So you can see it's a bit bumpy. Uh, that was based on free free emission. This time we have a much smoother distribution. But it's based in this strong assumption, no? that the SED is a good way of getting star formation. And the second one is we don't have distances for the dust. So we have to assume that there's some component of the CO that is 
related to that dust, and then that uh, circular motions around the galactic center are good to get distances to those objects. So that's a lot of assumptions. So it came as a surprise when we compare it to this. So this is a star formation rate that you get this time, not from the dust clumps, but from the current population of O, B, and A stars measured by Gaia. So this is the work of Eleonora Tsari. What she did was using the distances to those uh, stars and uh, the age distribution. She just simulates what is the birth rate of those stars in different age bins. And it turns out that the highest age bin, that the lowest age bin, so between 5 and 10 mega years, actually corresponds to a relatively recent star formation, is the one that is the most peaked, as the older bins are very, are very flat. So she uses this to argue that the star formation in the Milky Way just started in the last 10 mega years. Relatively, it was very, relatively low before. Of course, this depends on the population of the other stars. But what is very interesting for us is actually the same distribution, more or less, within a factor of two of what we found with the clumps. So the distribution of the star formation has the same feature. It decreases radically from a uh, galactocentric radius of 5 all the way to a galactocentric radius of around uh, 10 and more. And the functional form is pretty much the same. You can believe or not this uh, decrease uh, because Eleonora only has stars within 3 kiloparsecs from, uh, from the sun. So going uh, that far is, is a bit difficult. That's a very good question. So Heigl clump is uh, when you take one of these maps and then across the, wa the wavelengths, you identify something that looks a little bit uh, compact. So that depends on distance. So for nearby stuff, you may be picking YSOs. So for the nearby stuff, you don't consider. As you go further and further, you're picking something more like clumps or like sub-fragments that are inside of a molecular cloud, for example. And when you go far away, the clumps must be like um, a whole molecular cloud. So a clump is just an entity defined from the observation. It's, it's a compact source in the Heigl uh, survey. So when you go too far, it's very big. When you're very nearby, it's YSOs. But they use that to calibrate. OK, so now, so this is the distribution that we get uh, from Davide Elias uh, data. And this is the part that is being sampled by Eleonora Tsari. So what you're seeing in that plot is just the decrease from here all the way out here. So how does that look in distribution? So it looks like this. So uh, Davide used kinematic distances. And kinematic distances suck particularly bad uh, <laughs> close to the galactic center and the galactic anticenter because there you're dominated by, uh, by non-radial motion. So uh, most likely, this stuff here is further than you think or further away, but there are some similar features. For example, W3, 4, and 5, these complexes are both sampled by the two, uh, by the two tracers. And also, the increase of a star formation around the fourth quadrant, there's actually a lot of star formation in the fourth quadrant. So now we can even see where, is, where are these stars, where are they being born, and where is their energy input. So now let's continue with this. Uh, so let's go back to Orion. So what else is there to learn from Orion? There's a last form of feedback that I haven't discussed so far, and it's supernova. And supernova are super cool, but they are super hard as well. Uh, but they are the large scale environment in which our molecular clouds live. So this is a very good example from the work uh, with Andrea Bracco and Andy Pond. So this is the Orion Eridano super bubble. So you he see here some of the most famous molecular clouds. This is Taurus at 150 parsecs. This is Orion at 450 parsecs. And then you see this big bag of magnetic field and H1 that was already identified in the 70s. This was identified for the first time in H alpha, then in ionized sulfur, and then in H1 by Carl Hylas in the 70s and 80s. And it turns out that it has a counterpart in magnetic field. So it's behaving exactly like we would expect uh, the expansion of a supernova or a bubble within a magnetized, uh, a magnetized medium simply by flux freezing. The field is just a stretch along the sides of that cavity. And then you have accumulation of the field lines in the edges of that cavity. So that's cool. So what about magnetic fields? Well, they are there, for sure. And what do we learn from that? Well, that's something that I was trying to do for this object. So I'm going to show you the story of Taurus. 
So Taurus, at 140 parsecs from us, is relatively close by, has 10 to the 4 solar masses, have, doesn't have high mass star formation, so I'm not worried about other effects that come from the feedback within the cloud. So there's uh, outflows, of course, but they are not dominant in the large scale structure of this. So this is kind of all the information that we have on large scales from Taurus. We have uh, column density from Planck, we have CO, we have H1 from uh, Galpa H1, and the new technology that we have is the 3D dust. Now we know where things are with respect to the line of sight. So you can play a game and it's, you can tie the velocities that you see in CO with the distances that you see in the 3D dust. So that is what we did. We used an algorithm that matches shapes using the gradients. It's called the Astrohog. And if you're interested in matching shapes in your data, that's something that you can do. And this is what we found. So to make a long story short, the most nearby part of Taurus, which is here, is at a higher velocity than the part that is further away. So the slope is like this. So let's disentangle that. The part that is the furthest away is moving faster than the part that is nearby. So effectively, Taurus is doing this with respect to you. The cloud is being compressed. So we went and looked what can be producing this. We look at the YSOs, and the YSOs seem to be behaving in a different way. The YSOs are not having any, uh, any signal, and the YSOs are nice because they can measure everything in 3D. The YSOs are not collapsing, not in 3D, not in 2D. The YSOs seem to be doing something else. So most likely, this is not large-scale gravitational collapse bringing everything into the middle. Uh, we have a very good candidate uh, for that motion. So these are the YSOs. So you can see that that is the slope that we see in the dust and the CO but the YSOs seem to not know about that. Even uh, clusters of YSOs at different ages, they don't seem to know about that. But we know that Taurus is sandwiched between the local bubble and the Pertau shell discovered by Shmuel Bialy uh, right here. And so the story would be the following. If you have this sandwich between two clouds, sorry, between two shells propelled by supernova, most likely this is going to affect the diffuse gas with respect to the YSOs that are compact objects. So this is going to be like fluff, the fluff of the gas moving with respect to the YSO. So they won't be collisional with respect to this effect of feedback. So I think this is an indication that you're blowing material through the collision of these two bubbles, but that is not enough, at least to affect the current generation of stars. Maybe in the future it's going to accumulate enough mass. In the end, you're just putting together more material in that parcel of gas. So it may form stars later. But for the moment, is not doing anything for the YSOs. It's just accumulating some of the gas. So that was a nice trick. And uh, so we did it for Taurus. Doing it for other clouds is tricky because you need high resolution both in the uh, 3D dust and in the CO, but that's work in progress. If you're interested in your favorite cloud and see if we can do this, let's give it a try. So again, feedback. The Orion Eridano super bubble is filled with H alpha emission. So most likely, if you think that this is a cavity that has been vacated by the supernova, but it's seeing the, mass, the high mass stars coming from, uh, from Orion up there, you can relate the structure of the PDR here at the edges of the bubble to just the energy inflow from there. But there's a big feature that we have no idea where it comes from, and it's this one. It's one of the most famous features in the sky. This is the Barnard loop, and we cannot model that. We know that this layer can be explained by the emission from the massive stars in Orion, so up here. But this thing we, we couldn't, we didn't know, and that is the work of uh, Mike Foley. So Mike uh, used new tracers, so he used X-rays to trace another supernova remnant within the Orion Eridano super bubble that is 200 parsecs wide. So this is not just one supernova. You need at least 10 to the 50 four ergs to blow this bubble. So most likely we're talking about at least 100 supernova, if supernova are the only thing that are blowing, is blowing away this bubble. And what Mike did using the new fantastic identification of clusters with Gaia is that most likely the Barnard's loop, this feature that is so prominent in the sky, is illuminated by this cluster that is up here. So that's one mystery of astronomy that may be solved. So it's not a supernova shell in this case, it's just seeing this, mass, this uh, high mass star cluster. OK, so what else have we learned? Uh, this is work with Theo Jubo, uh, that uh, Theo Jubo was a student with Isabel Canier. And when he finished his PhD, he became a carpenter. And uh, if you want to buy furniture for him, uh, you better save your whole salary for a year. So <laughs> that turned out well for him. 
And he was not only assembling furniture, but he was assembling the X-rays uh, from Rosat. And he found this bag of, uh, of X-rays towards the southern part of the Orion Eridano superbubble. So despite the fact that the bubble has been blown into its current size, there's still some hot gas in the lower part. So this is telling that it's still actively um, accumulating some of the hot gas. So this has to be less than a few mega years ago that the last supernova blew and uh, inflated this side of the cavity. So why is this difficult? Because soft X-rays have lots of extinction effects. So you won't see it. If there's anything in front, if there's a layer of, of dust, you would have to correct for that. So to get this clean cavity, you can only do that with dust in 3D. Now we know where the filaments are, and we know that those filaments are between us and the cavity. So that's the work of Theo. Then there's the work of Andrea Bracco uh, that is finding uh, synchrotron radiation towards the upper part of uh, Orion Eridanus. So this is extremely weird because you don't expect synchrotron radiation coming from the neutral medium. And yet, this is extremely bright and is, uh, is a coincidence. So this is the emission. So this is at uh, 74 um, uh, uh, megahertz. And he sees this arc, which is coincident with one of the dust uh, 3D features that is shown by that contour. So what I want you to remember is just this white stuff here is coincident with this stuff, which is coming from the 3D dust. So there he has a proof that at least the neutral medium also knows about the synchrotron, but you have to go to very low frequencies to start seeing that effect. Uh, supernova remnants, I think I'm going to go a little bit faster. So of course, you can identify supernova remnants in the galactic plane as well. You can do it with uh, radio emission or x-rays. But as I told you, once uh, the hot gas inside cools down or escapes the cavity, then you don't see it anymore in x-rays. And then it's only bright in radio emission uh, for 100,000 years or less. So the way that people prefer to identify their uh, H1, uh, their um, supernova remnants, is through the pattern of expansion. So you have heard all about bubbles, and we're seeing bubbles all over in other galaxies. Well, people have been seeing bubbles in our galaxy for a really long time, and they have been trying to identify the supernova bubble. So the process is, as you remember, you have the ejecta for the supernova that blows uh, a cavity, and then you have accumulation of matter here in the edge, and then you have the reverse shock going in the other direction. So that has an imprint, a kinematic imprint, and a spatial imprint. So you would see it as a loop. So this is work uh, with the SGPS by Naomi McClure Griffith. And if you, have, uh, if you have that cavity that is being blown, you would expect to see the front and the back of the bubble moving away from the center of the explosion. And that's the way people have tried to identify the effect of supernova bubbles. So this is, so far, the most complete catalog of uh, H1 bubbles identified with the H1 emission. This is old H1 emission at low resolution. This is the work of Elen uh, Sonia Elorova and Jean Palouche. And they did this by eye. And so far, uh, people have tried to do this in an automated way. And it's not an easy problem. It's not a very easy problem. You run into hisas. Some of the hisa of the H1 self-absorption is confused with this. Some of your loops are like irrationally big. So this bubble, uh, nobody would believe. This is the Orion Eridano super bubble. This will be uh, supernova related to the Northern Galactic Loop. So how can we do it in a different way? So here, now I'm going to show you a little movie of uh, what we try to do. So before I, I play the movie, can I have a show of hands how many of you have seen the H1 towards the galactic plane? OK, like half. OK, so I'm going to play the movie. That's even music. So what is what we did? We tried to describe this field that is tremendously complicated, describing it in terms of filaments. It's just one way of the multiple waves that you have of, uh, to describe such a complex field, but it's the way that we picked. And why are filaments a good idea? And what is interesting about filaments? 
So if you see most of those structures, the width is a very bad thing to measure. Most of the widths of those filaments are the beam of the telescope. So when you find uh, a statistical study of the filament width in H1, most likely you're going to find your, the, the resolution of your telescope and you will see why. So what we decided to measure was not the width, not the length, which is extremely ill-defined, but the orientation. Because, I mean, it's something that we can relate to the models. We know that if you have lots of supernova feedback, and this is the work of Rowan Smith, and the supernova feedback is clustered, you're very efficient at lifting material off the disk. If the supernova are randomly distributed, most likely you're not going to see this lifting of material being so efficient. So at least we have a prescription for the orientation maybe telling us something about where the supernova feedback is putting that. So um, I converted the H1 emission into filaments and then I measured their orientation. So if you have a spectrum of H1, like you have here in the top for a region of two by two degrees towards the galactic plane, then you can make a spectrum of also the orientation of those filaments. So in this case, those filaments would be oriented parallel to the galactic plane, uh, but that is kind of a, not a very nice way of doing it. You can turn the problem of angle orientation into a problem of random walk. So you can quantify the significance of that preferential orientation, parallel perpendicular to the plane using this thing. It's called the projected rally statistic. We introduce it into magnetic field studies. So instead of seeing the angle, now what you're seeing in positive and negative is like a sigma. So here, eight sigma means uh, eight V equals eight is an eight sigma significance of the orientation of the filaments being preferentially parallel to the galactic plane. Of course, this is a cosine, so I just multiply it by two to also use the 90 degrees. So if it's negative, it, is, it has the same meaning, but not for zero degrees, so parallel to the galactic plane, but perpendicular to the galactic plane. So how does that look when we apply it to, for example, the H14 pi data? So coarse resolution, 16.4 uh, arc minutes, and it looks like this. So this is an LB diagram, but instead of intensity, what you're seeing is the orientation of the filaments in the galactic plane, of the H1 filaments in the galactic plane. So you see here lots of blue, mostly perpendicular uh, to the galactic plane, and red, mostly parallel to the galactic plane. So this is a map of where the filaments are pointing. So if you want a more familiar representation, you can assume circular uh, velocities around the galactic center. Most of the red, most of the parallel filaments are in the outer galaxy. Most of the filaments that are perpendicular are in the inner galaxy. Of course, you have the ambiguity here of near and far, so maybe it's better to show a profile of orientation. So what we're seeing is that as you're going with galactocentric radius, you go from mostly perpendicular into undecided, then you see lots of local stuff, but you have, on average, a progression from mostly perpendicular to mostly parallel with increasing galactocentric radius. How can we explain that? So this is how it looks. You have lots of bubbles, you have lots of structures that have been described as worms and chimneys by Carl Hylas, and in the outer galaxy you mostly have flatter stuff. It's not that you don't have perpendicular stuff, it's that it, that is not the dominant orientation in the outer galaxy. If you look at it in high resolution, those filaments, those parallel filaments, don't resolve into perpendicular structures. They resolve into even more parallel structures. So most likely, this can be related to the mechanism that Carl Hylas proposed. And it's, these are chimneys that are blown out by supernova explosions in the galactic plane. So you lift material, and what we're seeing is just the remnant of those supernova explosions pointing perpendicular to the galactic plane. Uh, I still have two minutes, so I'm going to show you this little movie produced by Philip Girihidis. So this is a supernova uh, uh, multi-phase ISM with multiple supernova explosions. And this is the H1 in that simulation. So what we think we're seeing is structures like this. Gas that is being blown out of the disk, the top is, uh, is blown out, just pops by the difference in pressures, and what you're left with is those filaments on the sides that are keep co kept coherent by magnetic fields. But I'm going ahead of myself, so I'm just going to go ahead of uh, conclusions. So now let's look at, the same, uh, at that trend, mostly perpendicular, mostly parallel, and then it kind of goes away everywhere at 20 kiloparsecs, so this is really far. And now let's look at the star formation profile. So it is coincident, the change in orientation is coincident to the place where you actually don't expect to have so many high mass stars, so not so many supernova explosions, and actually where the volume that you're covering by each supernova explosion is even larger. So this adds up uh, to most likely we're seeing 
the decrease effect of the supernova explosions in the outer galaxy. When you see the inner galaxy, you're mostly dominated by those explosions. And also here are the supernova bubbles that are known, although this is extremely biased uh, catalog, it's not complete, but we know that most of the supernova bubbles that we know are towards the inner galaxy, are within uh, galaxy centric radius of, ten, of uh, 10 kiloparsecs. We tried that at even higher resolution. It resolves very nicely, and now this is with Thor, and we see that that big blue blur can be mapped into some particular regions. And those regions are actually coincident this is for the large scale. Now you're seeing here in blue, in green, the star formation at the high mass star formation are straight by radio recombination lines. So the blue is coincident with the star formation. We don't see the same when we just look at Thor. It's, uh, it's a little bit more difficult because there's a star formation all over. But for example, in W51 that we know is, uh, is a very active region of a star formation and there's main sequence feedback, there are not supernova explosions yet. So maybe that is what is happening. We're just not seeing the cluster supernova or we don't have enough supernova in that region to lift the material. So uh, I show you many things, I didn't mention this. So before I say my conclusions, I'm going to give a two minute mini story, Alisa, if you allow me. So this is my conclusions, no? So I show you all of this, uh, change in filament orientation, a molecular cloud that is affected by these uh, two shells and the star formation profile of the Milky Way. So, I think there's a metaphor to make about feedback, and it's how we understand all of this complexity. And this is my two minutes of story, and then I'll shut up. When we think of star formation, we think automatically of molecular clouds. And this is a map that was made here, uh, almost 20 years ago. And that is fine, that has been our picture for a really long time, as this was a picture of the world for a really long time. So this is a map of the world from the best authorities. Um, uh, in 1872, this ship called the Challenger, actually the Space Shuttle Challenger is named after this ship, went around the world for four years sampling the bottom of the ocean. At the moment, people didn't know anything about the bottom of the ocean be beyond 100 meters below the sea. So they went around, so this is a picture of the, fo of the postdocs cleaning the data. <laughs> and among the many things that they did well, they did something that we astronomers should do, and is they asked for funding for the data analysis. So seven years after the expedition finished, they were publishing volumes with the, sampling, the bathymetric samplings of the bottom of the ocean. And that is what we see here, which doesn't look as pretty, but if you see it like this, it looks like that. Most of what we know about the bottom of the ocean, tectonic plates, development of continents, comes from this data that was not directly derived to observe this particular phenomenon. So maybe when the problem is so complex, we should just understand our surroundings, look more at our surroundings, and be fascinated by how amazing is everything that we're finding, and then maybe the answer to more complicated problems is there. And that's the end. Thank you, Juan. That was just fabulous. Um, so we have just like five minutes for questions, I believe. Um, and then just as a heads up, um, everybody on the organizing committee should be prepared to stand up in about three or four minutes, so don't go away. Um, Eric. So you, you, went, you were talking about the, um, I forget which one of them, but you mentioned something about confined by magnetic fields, filaments being confined by magnetic fields. What, in what sense are they confined? Uh, thinking there, there's kind of tran transient structures that you know, they're yeah, so maybe if I say confined, uh, it was the wrong wording because I don't think this is confined by magnetic field. I think what is happening here is supernova beats the magnetic field and blows the matter. And then if anything is confined by magnetic fields, is whatever is developed here. So here, if you're going to have accumulation of matter, it's going to know about that field direction. We know the field here is a little bit higher than the standard five microgauss. It's more like 12, 20 microgauss, give or take. So if I say confinement, it was a miswording. It's just uh, the magnetic field was pushed away by the supernova. I guess. Um, so you mentioned these like H1 filaments being uh, sort of parallel to the disk and the outer disk, but the outer disk is warped. So is it parallel to the like the plane of the inner disk, or is it parallel to the like warping of the disk? So <laughs> when you're very far, it doesn't really matter. It's like uh, in the end. Uh, is to the local warp. So uh, when 
when you, when I made this uh, this plot here, so each of the points in this, in each of the pixels in this plot corresponds to a tile of three degrees by twenty degrees. So when I do the orientation, it's with respect to that local flat. So it doesn't really matter if it's doing like that on a large scale. In the end, I'm just calculating that with respect to the local zero degrees, which doesn't change that much, even if you're warped. I see the warp as well. So yeah, thanks, Alisa. Yeah, I do see the warp. So uh, I have the warp somewhere. I can show you, but we do see the warp. We have time for one more question, so we'll give it to Blakesley. Thank you. This is fantastic. You've shown so much beautiful data and synthesized it so well for us. And I just want to ask you, what do you think, like in the next five or 10 years, the big questions are, how can we use this data to answer those big questions? Not a, not <laughs> yeah, a that's a good question. question. So <laughs> certainly in each one, we're limited by, uh, by resolution. So 21 centimeters is like a uh, an order of 100 bigger than the CO lines. So that means we need a telescope that is 100 times larger. I think we're getting there with the SKA. Uh, uh, now uh, North America is catching up with the NRAO uh, uh, <laughs> new generation VLA. So we're going to have mapping at high resolution of H1. So not only for our galaxy, but for other galaxies as well. And with high resolution and higher mapping speeds, those big bubbles that we see in the FANGS galaxies, maybe in the future we'll be able to see the top and the bottom of that bubble. And that would be a smoking gun of feedback. Because if you can see not only the shape, but you can also see the displacement, you can calculate the amount of, mo of momentum that that bubble is generating. So I think it's going into that direction, interferometry. Unfortunately, I wish I could say the same for magnetic fields. Uh, magnetic fields, I show some of the magnetic fields, and to the moment, Planck is the best that we have. We have balloon-borne experiments that are proposed, but pretty much Planck is the best that we have and we're going to have for the next decade, most likely. Once again, underappreciated magnetic fields, Blakesley. Anyway, thank you again, Juan. And can I invite the organizing committee up to the front? Thank you. Thank you.